Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, CTLT Summer Institute event. Uh, it's exciting to be back again. <clears throat> um, and also exciting that the new school year is just around the corner. So today we're going to be uh, presenting on building community across campuses, preparing to teach a multi-campus or distributed learning course. So my name is Dr. Casey Kulin. I'm in the Department of Materials Engineering, and I'm an assistant professor of teaching. Um, I teach in the Manufacturing Engineering Program, which is a multi-campus program, and that's kind of what got myself interested in um, in this topic. Um, I do a lot of my work with Dr. Christoph Seelman, who's in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, also for Manufacturing uh, Program, and that's kind of how we we kind of came together on this um, on this topic. And as we were going about our our adventure with it or our research with it, we came to meet um, Dr. Ellie Park, who's with the Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, she's located in the Prince George uh, distributed site. So she kind of lives and breathes the um, distributed teaching, the multi-campus instruction uh, type of um, uh, mode of delivery um, day in, day out. So we're really happy to, to be working with her and learning from her. Um, and then before we get too much further, I'd like to do our land acknowledgement. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish First Nations on which we're learning, working and organizing today. And I'm actually um, on uh, Ufluit uh, First Nations land right now. And I'll pass it over to Ellie for the Prince George acknowledgement. Good morning. Yes, and I am currently in Clayton Tanay First Nation, um, also known as Prince George. And I just wanted to share that uh, I love the name Clayton Tanay because it does mean where the two rivers flow together, um, and the people. And um, for me, it really does signify a gathering place. Um, for those of you who know, uh. Northern British Columbia, Prince George is definitely a hub of the North. So I'm really excited to be here today and uh, thank you for being here to listen to our talk. Thank you very much, Ellie. All right, so I'm gonna proceed from here. So hello everyone and thank you also for joining. Uh, we'll start by talking a bit about what we mean by multi-campus instruction. So, so fundamentally, uh, multi-campus instruction involves multiple groups of students at separate sites uh, operating in classrooms. So we have, let's say, uh, one location where we have an instructor present uh, along with a cohort or classroom, as, as we're all very familiar with. Uh, but then similarly, uh, at the same time, we have other locations that have students in classrooms attending through uh, usually video conferencing. So in this mode of education, uh, we have a single instructor typically located at one site, which just for purposes of, of simplicity, we'll call the local site moving forward. Uh, and then we have ICT video conferencing to other sites. And so here we have examples, for instance, where we have students at other locations who are who are sitting within a classroom setting and attending the presentation or lecture uh, by, by uh, video conferencing. So this is a little bit different from hybrid learning, uh, where um, there are, for instance, distributed educational models where hybrid learning uh, allows students to connect, uh, let's say, through uh, uh, strictly remote means such as Zoom, uh, but they don't have that, that experience of community necessarily in the classroom uh, that you get by attending in person. So that's how we'll differentiate the two a little bit and differentiate this from hybrid learning. The campuses may be in the same region uh, or another part in the world. And so we have lots of examples internationally where campuses are actually located in entirely different countries and, and you have to worry about linguistic barriers, uh, cultural barriers, as well as just uh, spatial distance or, or distance barriers. Uh, community is a particularly challenging concept in in this space because of of how complicated the the relationships tend to become uh, and and we have of course community considerations between communities of teaching assistants if you have a local site and you have several distributed sites uh, then you have to consider how these teaching assistants are engaging amongst themselves across let's say very large regions we have relationships between teaching assistants at local and remote sites and students at local and remote sites uh, as well as instructors at lo local sites and remote sites and so on. So we, we have this, this very big uh, network of, of community uh, where we have relationships between teaching assistants and teaching assistants, teaching assistants and students, instructors and teaching assistants and so on uh, over a very large area. And this can be difficult to manage 
But past this point or beyond this point, we also have to consider other factors, such as administrators. If, if we're involving multiple locations or multiple sites, then there's administrators at each location that have to communicate as well, uh, let's say around scheduling cons uh, considerations. And so we're expanding community to consider administrators as well. We have support staff at each location. At each location. So support staff can support, uh, let's say, uh, IT. Uh, requirements at each location. So ensuring that uh, the, the technology is working where you can have this video conferencing experience between classrooms. Uh, also scheduling staff, for example. So uh, you, you develop a community around support staff as well that also engages potentially with teaching assistants and let's say supporting communications technology as well as with instructors. Uh, there's directors and heads. If, if you have a single program or a course, let's say that's spanning across multiple locations, then there has to be some discussion around quality assurance between those locations, uh, consistency and learning outcomes, as well uh, resources available to instructors and students. Uh, so this entails developing community amongst directors and heads as well. And then community partners. Uh, so depending on the sort of work that you're doing, if there's let's say, let's say uh, community experience or community learning opportunities, then uh, each each context or each location is going to have uh, a community built around their local area and and uh, sharing that community across a larger larger space, often when constrained by communication technologies, is is another aspect of this challenge. And so we have. Um, a really complex uh, type uh, of, of collection of communities that, that develop around a multi-campus course or multi-campus program. So bearing this in mind and, and considering all the moving pieces that we're alluding to as part of this and, and the, the complexity around community that that forms, we're just going to have a just a very, very quick waterfall uh, uh, Zoom experience here where I'm going to ask you what could possibly go wrong in a, in a situation like this. So, so where you have all these different pieces at play, uh, in 10 words or less, just write something th in, into Zoom chat, don't hit enter yet, and then I'm going to ask everyone to press enter at once, and we'll just see what, what comes to mind in terms of potential challenges around attempting to foster community and 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 run such a course or a program uh, easily. And I'll give maybe about 30 seconds. All right, yes, oh, we have some great ones already. So instructors and uh, TA supports people are sick, and so if there's illness, uh, how do you compensate uh, or how do you accommodate uh, contingencies such as illness? Um, engagement is huge. That is an absolutely massive issue, and, and that speaks very, very closely to community. Uh, tech, uh, tech breakdowns, IT fails, technical failures, technical uh, technology fails, tech failure. Absolutely, this is a very, very common theme, and, and certainly in the literature, it, it's, it's one of the items that's highlighted most. Uh, uh, it, it creates such a sense of inequity if, if technology fails in the middle of a presentation and uh, the instructor continues locally, but the remote students don't have the benefit of that instruction. Um, different areas of collating information. Yes. So, so community can be expressed across different media as well, uh, whether emails, forums, chats. Uh, often uh, learning support tools are, are a big part of that as well. Misinterpretation of information. Yes, especially cross-cultural or linguistic boundaries. Uh, conflicting policies, certainly. Fire drill at a location. I haven't heard that one before. That one's new. Wow. Um, yes. So, so if one, if one, if one hall empties out and the rest of the students proceed, what do you do in a situation like that? So, um, Yikes. Yes. Okay. Very, very interesting. So absolutely. Th these are all major concerns that that crop up. And, and it speaks to some some particular and peculiar challenges that, that occur in this format of instruction that you don't encounter as readily in other formats. So thank you very much for, for your contributions there. So um, at some point in time, usually in this process of engaging in multi-campus instruction, uh, there's usually a program in place or, or at least some courses in place or instructors who have experience teaching in a single cohort class. And the question becomes, okay, how do we transition this course or this program into multi-campus course? Or how do we engage additional campuses, campuses as part of this? I've, I've had several colleagues reach out to me with this very question. Um, and there, there are several considerations that you should basically begin by asking yourself. So the first is, uh, how is interaction going to work? How are uh, instructors going to interact with remote TAs or remote instructors? How are students going to engage across large distances? Uh, how are you going to share presentation material with, with uh, students in remote locations? And how are you going to engage in asynchronous work? So this question of interactions, all the different ways that we interact uh, uh, towards forming community is, is a really, really big part of the early discussion in terms of transitioning to multi-campus instructional format. Next, we have the instructors themselves. Uh, I, I've had uh, a surprising number of instructors approach me and say, yes, we teach multi-campus, but we don't have TAs and we don't have instructors at the remote sites. We just have students show up in a classroom and we're expected to teach them in, in this format. And, and this is this is such a recipe for, for disaster, I'll, I'll tell you right now. Uh, even, even having teaching assistants at a remote location as opposed to, to trained facilitators or trained instructors uh, can, can already 
make a challenging problem much, much worse. So uh, the, the the other end of the scale, I think Ellie has some experience in this certainly is, is where we have trained instructors or professors essentially at every location acting as facilitators uh, and supporting the, the, the single instructor at the local cohort. But building that dynamic, or at least understanding what resources are required uh, instructionally to, to succeed at this is, is a big part of the work as well. Uh, technology is a big question here. Now, now um, a key consideration here is that more is not always better. Uh, and you have to think about technology in the classroom, but also technology outside the classroom. So what kind of learning management systems are you going to use? How are you going to build activities, uh, if let's say in a blended learning style, using learning management systems uh, to complement what's actually taught in class? Uh, and in classroom, uh, how how well equipped is that space? How are you going to uh, let's say uh, deal with technology failures, or or if someone can't show up on time, or um, yeah, all, all of this really goes into a lot of contingency planning. So so uh, uh, assessing the technology available at every site, understanding the limitations of those technologies, and building contingencies around those technologies again should be a really big part of early discussion about transitioning to multi-campus instruction. And then finally, physical space. Uh, I'll talk about this more in a moment, but context uh, is is absolutely key in in achieving equity and learning outcomes between locations. So if you have one one campus which is very large, another campus which is very small, and they have different accesses, uh, the students have different access to resources, whether it's uh, let's say lab uh, lab facilities or or learning spaces uh, or library facilities, that can have a, a huge impact on your learning as well. And also the the, the classroom spaces themselves. If it's if it's a fairly modern, uh, well equipped classroom versus a, let's say a classroom which doesn't have the same benefits. Um, as as the local cohort, uh, that can again speak a great deal to equity and and maintaining equity of learning outcomes and this this holistic community experience is so essential towards uh, student experience in multi campus instruction. Uh, so Bahamani, uh, Bahamani and Geltzvold, uh, these are Scandinavian instructors or professors who are very active in this space as well. Uh, have, have adapted a bit of a saying where they're saying that uh, adapting a site uh, or multi campus. I'm sorry, a site cohort, so a single cohort uh, course to a multi-campus format can be comparable in effort to creating a whole new course from scratch. So if if you're thinking of, of let's say you have a course and let's say you're teaching mathematics and you want to just take this mathematics course and expand it across multiple uh, uh, cohorts, multiple sites, and, and call it that as a five-minute activity, uh, that will not go very well. Uh, we can say that from experience. So, so plan to put in some significant effort. Extraordinary care must be taken in planning, preparing, and training, not even so even before adapting slide content, before uh, choosing activities or considering asynchronous, synchronous components, even in the planning stage of, of how this can work is, is a huge amount of effort. And community is, is really core to that. So I'll quickly go through some benefits and some downsides, and then we'll move on to our next activity. So why why even do this? What's what's the value in in, in this effort? Um, so, so number one is improved educational policy uh, possibilities for students in remote communities without requiring relocations. This one is, is honestly really, really huge. Uh, Australia engages quite a bit in this in this type of, of work because uh, uh, they're trying to reverse this drain of talent from small communities going to large communities. Because when you have uh, physiotherapists, when you have engineers, when you have doctors uh, uh, go from small communities to large communities to study, they rarely go back to their home locations. Uh, so by creating these satellite sites or, or enabling local colleges to support multi-campus instruction, um, and and uh, permit those students to learn uh, uh, very, very valuable skills uh, at, in, in their home locations, then you have less of this bl uh, brain drain towards towards urban areas and, and it supports rural communities much better. So this, this is a really, really important one. It, it, it permits greater equity and access to resources for, for uh, rural communities. Uh, expanding perspectives by learning together with students from different backgrounds. So cultural sharing, of course, is, is very important as well, uh, particularly if you're crossing uh, countries uh, or, or languages. Uh, this can be a really great learning opportunity for your students as well to, to understand their learning in different contexts. Uh, instructors can offer expertise to a broader group of students. Absolutely. We, we have experts at BBC, at UNBC, at U of Vic, all over British Columbia, and of course the world, uh, who are quite unique and internationally recognized in their skills. If they have the opportunity to, to uh, expand that learning or expand that training to, to uh, a larger group of students, then there's value in that as well. It gives also uh, smaller campuses an opportunity to have more tech electives or more uh, complementary studies electives uh, in their programs. Uh, greater access to a variety of courses, yeah, absolutely credible programs, consistent standards, that too. So larger institutions can can engage with small institutions uh, or, or let's say established programs with newer programs to ensure greater quality assurance or consistency. And there is a potential for reduced program cost. So if done well uh, with with careful planning, uh, there are definitely efficiencies that can be realized in this system. 
That said, major challenge, major challenges. Uh, we've we've heard some of our uh, colleagues say rather glibly um, that <laughs> the the objective really in multi campus instruction is to minimize the the mis uh, how miserable students are. So so if you can if you can get the students being marginally miserable, that's sort of the the ideal or the best possible scenario that you can envision. Which which um, I think we can do better than that. But there's definitely some big challenges that have to be overcome with this. So number one is is that the the effort involved, the planning involved, is often underestimated. So a lot of instructors will just say, oh, "I'll just throw my slides up uh, in in the remote site, or or I will share through Zoom, call it done, no problem. Students will attend, everything will be fine." Uh, we've <laughs> if if you do if you do literature literature search on this subject, you'll find that most of the case studies uh, uh, begin this way and end in some kind of disaster, uh, uh, often related to student equity. So uh, yeah, a lot of effort required here, especially in the fostering of community. Um, uh, managing that community is also a big challenge. Uh, as, as we just discussed, the instructor is, is not just considering themselves, their TA and their students. You now have multiple TAs, multiple instructors, multiple groups of students in different contexts, administrators, directors, uh, support staff, all that need to be considered when it, when engaging in your course. So uh, we some of our colleagues have, have said it just about doubles their workload in terms of actually successfully executing a course uh, because of, of the complexity of the community involved. Uh, Maintaining equity and learning experience is a big one. Uh, so if, if students and remote cohort often feel ignored or deprioritized or local cohort feel that the remote cohorts are taking too much of their instructor's time or distracting their instructor, uh, this can create enmity or animosity between students. And then they really start questioning, well, why am I spending this money? Uh, why do those students get access to this lab and I don't? Why do I have to watch demos remotely instead of actually seeing them in person? How is this affecting my learning? Uh, and I mean, these are very valid questions, and it leads to to uh, resentment potentially among students, student groups as well. And if, as an instructor, you're not within those communities very, very often, if at all, then then that resentment can fester and come to a boil. And and we we've had uh, yeah, we've seen some some pretty major blowouts in our time uh, because of a poor management of equity between cohorts or, or perceived inequity between cohorts. And then, as I've mentioned before, administrative planning and consideration. So. Um, it has to get really detailed. So never mind just room scheduling and ensuring classes that are at the same time at different institutions. Exam scheduling is a big one as well. So so ensuring that uh, all, all the locations have exams at the same time so the, so the instructor doesn't have to create multiple exams for, for different cohorts. Uh, um, hiring and maintaining teaching assistants. You're not just hiring one, you're hiring perhaps multiple, one for every site or, or engaging with multiple instructors at every site. So again, a fair bit of additional administrative load as well. Uh, now, I mentioned briefly context between cohorts, uh, because this, this speaks a great deal to equity and also to community. If we have an institution such as UBC on the left-hand side here, this is our Vancouver campus. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, I think this is a small uh, campus out of Alabama. And and the the scale of the institutions, the access to resources, the learning spaces, the library resources, the uh, lab spaces, the uh, just running into people in the hall who, who have uh, you know, a breadth of experience, th this all impacts student experience. And all of these factors have to be considered to the point where, where you may be adjusting your activities, adjusting your lab activities, uh, or even your assessments uh, to reflect the needs of every context. Beyond that, consider uh, students in different time zones, availability of resources like libraries, yeah, uh, cultural differences, again, play a role. So uh, as part of planning, sit down and think about every context in which your, your teaching will be experienced and, and plan about how you can adjust your teaching or the, the assessment or the activities to suit each context so that all students don't have the same learning experience, but critically the, the same learning outcomes. So to summarize some challenging areas, we have remote facilitation. So the technology around this, many of you highlighted technology failure, that's, that's absolutely key. We have classroom engagement. Uh, how do we maintain engagement? How do we build community? And critically, how do we design community? Because the answer may not be we want all students to interact with one another. We, we may not wish to have a single large community, but rather we want to foster lots of individual small communities. So even de deciding how you want to design community around your course, uh, depending on what it is you want to teach and the sort of activities you have, uh, will play a big role in, in uh, the success of your course. Equity, again, I'm going to center equity because perception of equity is, is absolutely key. If, if students don't consider the course to be fair, you will have problems. So, so ensuring that sense of fairness, fostering fairness, fostering equity is, is absolutely critical when this ha happens again at the planning stage. Stakeholder considerations. So think about all the different members that are not going to be part of your course. It will touch your course, uh, not just administrators, directors locally, but across multiple uh, uh, institutions. 
and scheduling and assessment logistics. Uh, even, even questions simple as uh, how are we going to get exams shipped from one location to another location for grading purposes? Uh, and, and what kind of delay is that going to add to grading? So, so I mean, even this can, can lead into issues if you're writing exams by hand. Good. And I'll pass it over to Ellie for our next activity. Thank you, Christoph. So I know that that was quite a bit of information for those of you who are not familiar with multi-campus instruction, or um, as we call in our program, we call it distributed learning. Um, but hopefully some of that resonated or some of that kind of triggered thoughts. And now we have an opportunity to discuss with one another. So it, I would welcome all of you to either use this QR code, or I think Christoph is going to add a link to Perfect to the chat box. Thanks, Christoph, for everyone to use. And what I've created is a Padlet, which is um, like a platform that you can use to share ideas. And this is actually one of the tools that we use in our program so that across different sites, and we have currently, we have three different distributed sites. So across the different sites, people can share their ideas and feel that uh, sense of equity or um, equal voices being heard. So hopefully we can kind of try that out here. What I'm going to do is I've divided our group into three different uh, breakout groups with each of the facilitators, Christoph, Casey and I leading. Um, and so we're gonna chat a little bit about what all of you are thinking within the Padlet and then have about a 10 minute discussion within our smaller groups. And then we'll come back to the larger group and we'll continue on. Um, I was just saying, I had a nice chat, nice discussion that last activity, um, and kind of got cut off. Um, but, uh, I guess that's good rather than the opposite where you don't have anything to talk about. Um, so thanks a lot. Let me get into a little bit more detail. So Christoph kind of laid out the, um, the lay of the land, so to speak. And then <clears throat> I'll talk in, in some more detail about some, uh, various, uh, points. Um, and then also just reminding everyone that the kind of the point of the presentation today is to talk about things to be aware of. So when you're preparing for this type of instruction, what kind of things should you be thinking about and maybe have a little bit of a game plan uh, more so than this is how you, you teach a course or this is how you do this, this is how you do that. It's more, hey, these are the things that come up, things that could go wrong. Um, suggest that you consider them and, and hopefully be prepared for them. Okay. Um, so talking about challenges with, uh, MCI, um, or multi-campus instruction, um, is kind of students just don't have, or a lot of students just don't have the familiarity with it. So they kind of come into the class and realize all of a sudden, oh, there's another cohort here, or, oh, my instructor is 400 kilometers away in a different uh, location. And then they start thinking, well, what does that mean? Is the university just trying to cheap out? Is the, did the last instructor kind of quit? last minute, you know, is it something out of the ordinary is happening? Um, this is not going to be a good experience for, for me or for our cohort. Um, I think just that lack of familiarity is, um, is a big thing for students. Uh, if you can kind of explain to students why multi-campus is good, what are the benefits, what are some of the things that can, um, can happen and that, that the students will, will really benefit from. Um, then that will get them going in the right path, hopefully, rather than right away thinking, oh, this is this is bad. It's going to get worse as the term goes on and they're already aiming kind of downwards. So just explaining that is, um, is something that could be beneficial. Um, another challenge comes up with remote facilitation. So I think this is the first thing that popped up on the waterfall earlier. Um, and I think this is definitely, this was the focus of of my concern when when I first started dealing with um, with this is losing the signal, losing communication, losing video feed or having a really bad video feed where it's really choppy and you you're cutting out all the time and that almost makes it worse than just losing the signal. Um, so some things to think about there are what kind of protocols would you have? So you're teaching the, the course, everything's going fine and all of a sudden you just completely lose connection. If you have some protocols, the TA on the remote site knows what to do. Maybe they can finish off the lecture if there's the last 10 minutes. Um, otherwise, maybe they know exactly who to call for IT support and the office is just around the corner. They can come over, get you back 
connected back in in a minute and continue to lecture as um, as usual. Um, even things like initiation procedures. So how do you start off the class? How do you get the connection going? Class starts at 10. Maybe the protocol is to start um, connecting at 9.50 or 9, 9.45 so you know that you're there. If you have any issues, you have 10, 15 minutes to work that out. Um, something else that you might consider is what happens if the remote TA is sick or someone can't make it that day? Um, do you have alternative facilitators that can come in, even just get the system booted up and, and running? Um, and how do you kind of initiate that? How do you get that started? So a lot of it kind of sounds like what you call a contingency plan. So having those kind of clearly thought out, clearly um, marked out so that both or all parties involved know what's happening um, is is great as well. Um, a big one, of course, is classroom engagement. So engaging, especially the remote cohort, can always be a challenge. What are some un unique ways to do that? What are some effective ways to do that? Um, lots of hands-on activities can be valuable, uh, kind of falling in line with active learning and, and that side of things as well. Um, and then think about what kind of um, activities can you have that are equitable across cohorts. So if you have something where the instructor needs to do kind of an intricate demonstration, and maybe the local cohort can see them doing that thing, whereas it's hard to see through video and the remote cohort is kind of lost and they're just not really benefiting from it. So a lot of thinking around engagement um, would, would be really beneficial for instructors. And just how do you keep them, keep them going, keep them um, uh, engaged and, and motivated? And there's just so many online tools these days as well. We just did some Padlet, we did some Zoom waterfall, Activities, there's, you know, there's tons of, of things that can um, can be used and can help people become or remain engaged, I should say. Uh, Christoph alluded to it, equity is a huge thing. So I think often the remote cohorts will think, oh, we've, they've got the cheap seats, as I've heard someone call it. And they're, you know, right off the bat, they're going to be um, treated as as a different cohort or as different um, kind of level of priority. Um, <clears throat> There are lots of sources of equity, so it's important to be be aware of and be um, be prepared for them. So things like access to communication with the instructor is one that comes up a lot. So you have the the local cohort; they can just walk up to the front and talk to the instructor, or especially before and after um, the lecture, um, they can walk you know down the hallway and, and chat with the instructor, or to go knock on their their um, their office door, for example. This um, isn't as easy for the, the remote cohort. Um, even if the local cohort isn't doing this, maybe they're never talking to the instructor outside of the time that um, the remote cohort is, is engaged. The remote cohort may think that those local students are, and that becomes a source of inequity or kind of a, a point for the remote students to think that they're getting a, a different experience. Um, same thing with access to technology. So maybe the um, maybe you have two remote cohorts. One of them is in an area where the internet is really poor, or maybe they're from different socioeconomic backgrounds where they're doing everything on their phone or on a, a say a lower um, capable, less capable device than the other cohort. And that kind of leads to inequity as well. Uh, maybe there's a way that you're delivering the course that benefits one student group over another. Um, and same thing with talking about technology going down. Um, if technology goes down, then the local cohort is still engaged with the instructor. The others aren't. Um, communication is a huge thing. So we talked about communicating with the instructor, how easy it is to communicate. We all know that um, students often are a bit hesitant to communicate and, you know, it's it might need a bit of encouragement. Add another layer of technology on that and, and um, a challenge for communicating. Um, just makes things or can make things a bit worse. Um, we also think or, or keep in mind too of the different communication channels. So let's see if I can use my my pen here. So we've got the the local instructor. They're communicating with the cohort that's in front of them. They're also communicating with the cohort that's um, remote. The local cohort and the remote cohort are also trying to communicate perhaps and maybe throw in a TA on each site as well. Um, just means 
that there's all these different channels of, of communication or potential for. Uh, so it's it's important for the instructor to be proficient with these kind of technologies and these methods of, of facilitating communication. So knowing how to use, if you're using Zoom chat, for example, or knowing how to use a, um, the system that's in the classroom uh, properly and effectively is great. I think probably lots of people have been in situations where the instructor just or the facilitator just isn't familiar with how to use certain things on Zoom, for example, or or maybe they started talking and they were muted like I just did. Those types of things um, just kind of hinder the, the learning um, um, experience. As well, important to remember all the different stakeholders that are involved. So plan for for having more kind of stakeholder management, you could say. So you've got the instructor, of course, you've got the local cohort, the remote cohort, maybe there's more than one remote cohorts. You've got the local TA that might be doing something uh, like a more conventional or traditional TA, TA duties. So marking assignments, for example, maybe supporting labs or tutorials. Then you've got the remote TA who perhaps is doing something a bit more akin to an instructor where they're helping with the lecture or even just getting the, the technology and um, up and running and, and helping with communication. So they may be, you know, have different different jobs. And then there's the um, program directors and admin staff that have to think about things like scheduling exams, scheduling classrooms that have the right technology, working out everyone's schedules. Um, all these different people kind of need to, to clearly understand how multi-campus instruction works and how to kind of plan accordingly for it. And then you might think, well, I'm the instructor, I'll let the the admin staff and the directors worry about things they can sort it out themselves. That's their job. But, you know, you're kind of advocating for yourself as an instructor, reminding them that, hey, these exam is very important to have these exams at the same time. Otherwise, we're talking about writing two different exams, which may be another source of, of inequity, because the one exam might be perceived to be easier, the other one's more difficult, or one of them maybe is, is scheduled on December 23rd, you know, whereas the other one is earlier, December 2nd, when it's a more convenient time, you know, things like that um, all, can all come into play as well. Um, another big thing is getting stakeholder feedback. So uh, hearing what the what the students are thinking, what the, the different cohorts are experiencing is, is really valuable, because if something is starting to go off the rails, find out early, and then you can hopefully uh, get it back on track. Um, one way of doing that is um, using a like a kind of an online survey tool. Uh, something that we've developed is the Community of Inquiry um, online survey survey tool, the cost we call it, uh, where you can very easily deploy this to students. They fill out um, a number of, of questions um, on, on the Likert scale, and then you get the results back and it kind of tells you what areas are um, are, are ranking high, what which ones are ranking poorly, and then you can kind of hopefully adjust accordingly. And this is really easy to use. It's something that you could, you know, do every every month or so, or um, or how, whatever uh, uh, frequency you'd like to deploy it at. Um, so yeah, there's a QRL, uh, sorry, a QR code down here for the UR, a URL that uh, you could look into if you're interested in that. Um, and then <clears throat> administration and logistics is a big thing. So finding the right classrooms with the technology enabled in them, scheduling the um, facilities, scheduling everything, um, trying to maintain equity across cohort schedules. So if you if one cohort is in a different time zone, for example, maybe that means their their class is late in the evening, which is not as equitable, or or early in the morning, um, and then exam times. We mentioned that as well. Okay, I rushed to the end. We're getting a little bit low on time, but uh, let me pull up the Padlet. And I'll pass it over to Ellie. Thanks, Casey. And I really appreciate everyone's uh, participation in the Padlet. I think um, hopefully it gives an opportunity for, because I know in the small groups we had our own discussions, but it gives an opportunity to share across. And that is one of the things that uh, we find challenging, right, is that you can have your in-person discussions at each of the different sites, but then how do you ensure that that those ideas and those rich discussions are being shared across. Um, so I just quickly looked through and jotted down some of the 
the main takeaways for each of the different four different er challenge areas. In terms of remote facilitation, um, most of you mentioned, you know, technology and the challenges of technology and too much technology. That is spot on. The students, especially at the remote sites or the at the some of the distributed sites, talk about you know tech fatigue because they're watching instruction on a screen for long periods of time. So we have to really be creative in breaking all that up. Um, and then we also, with the remote facilitation, have in our program in occupational therapy, have um, incorporated co-teaching. So um, although we really present it as if there's only instruction at one site, now we actually. In, we teach from all the different sites. And so we do a co-teaching sort of tag teaming of it uh, just to ensure that students at each of the sites feel like they're getting some in-person instruction. And we found that that's really effective. But as we also mentioned, that takes a lot more time. So that time factor, the stakeholders, the multiple stakeholders involved is really, really quite a challenge. Uh, in terms of community, I loved all of the different comments around community because yes, community has so many different layers. And um, one of the comments talked about, you know, the spaces. And that to me is really interesting because uh, one of the things we talk about is these liminal spaces, the spaces that you have, um, improvised conversations, you know, after class, how many of you have had students come up to you and, and ask you a question or have these chats with you? Well, we can't do that, you know, at the distributed sites. And so those students feel like they miss out. Um, and so the idea of community and space really are so important to consider. Um, and I do think that that intercampus rivalry can be a real thing where we start to talk about, oh, you know, in Prince George versus Vancouver. And there is a bit of a tension there, but really trying to foster levels of community and understanding that each community has something rich to bring to the whole, uh, I think is important. Um, with stakeholders, I think this, the student feedback is really key and especially students at the different sites because oftentimes students will feel like they're not heard uh, when they're not at the larger site or at the local site. And so incorporating some of that feedback, recognizing what they're contributing to, you know, the program and what feedback they have is very valuable, uh, is important. The multiple st stakeholders do require way more time. And I think that one is something we didn't consider. Uh, we calculated about 25 to 30% um, more, I guess, time needed for the same amount of content, if that makes sense. So we have teaching teams now. And so those teams require meetings and coordination. And so all of that is added time required for any one course being delivered. Um, and so that's really important. Equity among the staff and faculty was another point there that I, I really appreciated because as a faculty at a distributed site, you know, we experience similar to what the students experience. And I think that that's something we really need to also consider is that our staff and faculty at distributed sites or at other sites being heard, are they considered a valuable part of the team? And then lastly, with the administration, um, in terms of coordinating, coordinating admin is a big deal. And for us at this point, I don't know about others who have had experiences um, as newer distributed sites, I am a uh, teaching faculty, but I'm doing a lot of admin because we don't have enough admin capacity at our site. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of like, whoa, this wasn't part of my job description, but it needs to be done. And, um, you know, Judy, I know you're nodding because I think that you have experienced some of that too. Like uh, you sort of put on a lot more hats when you're at a distributed site because there's fewer people that have to kind of take on multiple responsibilities. Um, which is fine, but I think that that just needs to be recognized and um, added to whatever, you know, your expectations are. Uh, communication, you know, administrative communication, communication across the different classrooms, but across the different administrators, staff, faculty. Huge, really, really important. So I know we're running out of time. I'm really sad because I ho was hoping to have more of a discussion around this, but, um, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you have more questions and if you're... Uh, starting a distributed program or in the midst of planning one, I really encourage you to reach out and join our community of practice because uh, that is a, a great place to, to learn and then share ideas and for us to grow together. 
and I will let whoever was in charge of this next slide Great. take over. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ellie. Yeah. And maybe I'll, I'll highlight that as well. So um, something the three of us have been working on and, and others as well, of course, is a community of practice for people that do teach in this, um, with this method of teaching. Um, we have regular meetings, we have a website that we've put together, some resources available, um, and encourage people to get involved um, and, and you know, share your stories, what's working for you, what's not, um, who can help, who can help us, uh, that kind of thing would be fantastic. Um, and on that note, I will leave it at this slide. Um, and I guess we have a, well, maybe don't even have a minute left, but <laughs> um, happy to open it up for any other, um, two minutes left. <laughs> happy to open it up for any, um, any, any other comments, questions, concerns. Um, let's see if there's anything in the chat. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're, the three of us are open to feedback if you have anything, any comments to make. What worked today? What didn't work? What's worked for you in multi-campus instruction? What hasn't? Any kind of horror stories that you want to share are always, <laughs> always um, good. The, the juicier, the better. <laughs> Thank you for joining um, us today and really being actively um, a part of it. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much.